Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we looked at the catastrophic defeat that the Oxumites suffered at the hands of the Persians, losing all of their Arabian territories in the process. Now, it's possible that the Oxumite Empire could have recovered from this devastating war, if not for a series of coming developments that would not only destabilize Oxum, but would upend the entire geopolitical status quo and move the entire Near Eastern world from late antiquity into the early medieval era. Episode 24, The Rise of Islam, from the Oxumite Perspective. Before we truly begin this episode, I'd like to start with a not-so-quick disclaimer. This episode covers some stuff that is religiously sensitive, particularly with regards to his sections on the Prophet Muhammad. Now, as I'm sure you know, the Prophet Muhammad is an incredibly important figure not only to every sect of Islam, but also within the belief of many other religions as well, such as the Baha'i faith of Iran or the Druze faith of the Levant. Because this is a history podcast, I'll be discussing the life and times of Muhammad in a frankly quite dry and straightforward manner, like I've done with all other historical figures on the podcast. I think it's only fair that I treat all historical figures, no matter how sacred, in an unbiased manner. In my research, I relied primarily on the various biographies of Muhammad, with that of Ibn Ishaq being the primary biographical source as well as the painstaking work of Imam al-Bukhari in the verification of the authenticity of various hadiths attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, as well as more modern scholarships on the interpretation of these sources. If you think I've made any serious mistakes in this episode, you can reach me on Twitter, Instagram, through my email, or through the comment section on my blog. Anyways, thanks for bearing with me through this quite long disclaimer, and let's finally begin. For real this time. The year was 577, and the Oxumite Empire was in absolute shambles. After the rule of Ella Amidas, Oxum's tributaries in Nubia and Semien had broken away from the Oxumite fold. Yemen had fallen into Persian hands, and, as if things weren't bad enough, the Ethiopian highlands were still in a seemingly unending state of drought. Remember, a few episodes back, we talked about how a climactic shift caused the Earth's temperature to drop and monsoon rains to decline in East Africa. Well, that drought didn't just go away, and Oxum's agriculture was still reeling from this now decades-long lack of rainfall. Amidas had managed to narrowly avoid famine through the order of drastic agricultural reforms, which vastly increased food output. These reforms worked, but also had a devastating effect on the health of the soil surrounding the capital city. This decline in soil quality meant that farmers surrounding the city of Oxum were less productive than the rest of the country so Oxum's status as the economic center of the empire began to slip away during this era. In 577, Ella Amidas died, and the throne was given to his nephew, Caleb's son, Wazeb. Wazeb's reign didn't last long, and is honestly pretty obscure in terms of events. Despite the obvious challenges facing his rule, it seems that Wazeb's rule was mostly a relatively positive one. There's no physical or textual evidence for any revolts or major wars during his rule, and he continued to rule Oxum as a conservative promoter of the status quo. While Wazeb's rule was short and positive, ending sometime around 580 AD, his brief rule set a precedent from which all of his predecessors would descend. Throughout the late 6th century, the throne of Oxum was occupied by a series of moribund kings. They sat upon the throne of a kingdom which still possessed some real power, but each refused to institute any sort of significant reforms to the empire's economic or civic systems. And, to make it clear, these economic and civic systems were in desperate need of reform, they just weren't working anymore. With each succession, there is evidence of further decline in the empire's fortune. Each Negus's building projects grew successively less extravagant than those of the last, and the coins minted during the reign of each king have successively lower and lower gold content, indicating a dwindling of the economic strength of the Ethiopian highlands during this era. As agriculture in the highlands became less productive from drought and soil exhaustion, this decline in productivity had to be balanced out by an ever-growing demand for agricultural labor. Merchants, craftsmen, miners, and monks were forced to abandon their careers in the city and return to the rural farms where more labor was always needed. Additionally, remember how Oxum's former tributaries had receded from the empire's sphere of influence? Well, one of the main forms of tribute that Nubia and especially Semien would give out was in the form of gold. Oxum also no longer possessed a stranglehold on the trade that flowed from the Red Sea after the Persian conquest of Yemen, meaning that the Oxumite government lost access to the once lucrative stream of revenue that comes from taxing the merchants who used this narrow and crucial trade route. So, with these tributaries no longer under Oxumite control, Red Sea trade no longer producing the dividends that it once did, 
and the workers who once powered the lucrative urban economy receding into the countryside, the once powerful Aksumite economy gradually collapsed. Gersem, the Aksumite king who ruled from 600 to 614, was the last Aksumite king to use any gold in his coins. When Gersem died in 614, he left the throne of Aksum to his son, Arma. Arma ceased the production of gold coins, and instead began to mint silver coins during his rule, which would prove to be the last metal coins minted in Aksumite history. He didn't wage any foreign conquests, institute any major reforms, or really do anything to reverse the gradual decline of his empire. I doubt many of you listening have even heard this man's name before, but had his rule changed even just a little bit, the entire history of the medieval and modern world would be unrecognizable. But before I reveal how Arma's reign changed the world, I want to rewind a little bit. Across the Red Sea from Aksum, in the Arabian city of Mecca, in the year 570, an event is brewing which will prove to have enormous consequences for not just Arma's life, but the whole world. The same year that the Aksumite general turned King Abraha led his assault on Mecca in his failed attempt to destroy the Kaaba, a very important child was born. His name was Muhammad ibn Abdullah, and yes, he is that Muhammad. Despite being one of, if not the, single most important historical and religious figure of all time, making an accurate retelling of Muhammad's early years is surprisingly difficult. In fact, because of his importance, it's hard to determine which stories of the young Muhammad are true, and which are later fabrications developed after his death. Hundreds, if not thousands, of reputable and respected Islamic scholars have developed well-researched biographies of Muhammad throughout time, yet none of them seem to agree perfectly on the events of his early life. However, one thing that we know for certain about the young Muhammad was that he was from the Banu Hashim, a prominent clan within the Quraysh tribe which ruled Mecca at the time. The Banu Hashim clan, it is worth noting, was a clan with deeply rooted connections to the Aksumite merchant class. The Banu Hashim contained many of the most prominent merchants within Aksumite society. Muhammad's uncle, Abu Talib, was one of these merchants, meaning that in all likelihood, he had extensive experience trading with Aksumite merchants. Talib was also a Hanif, an Arabic word which means someone who embraced monotheism in pre-Islamic Arabia. Whether he was a Christian, Jew, or a man with his own unique beliefs that didn't really fall into any other category is unclear. A lot of Islamic scholars even display skepticism over the notion that Talib was a monotheist at all. And this question is further muddled by the fact that Talib's legacy has since been caught up in the political debates of the early Islamic world that would eventually produce the first sectarian conflicts, but, well, that's really off-topic. When Muhammad's parents died at a young age, it was Abu Talib who adopted the young boy, and made the young Muhammad accompany him on trade missions across the Red Sea and Levant. Throughout his youth, Muhammad gained a reputation as a faithful and honest young man, with many important people within the Quraysh society seeking him out as a mediator in personal disputes. At the age of 25, Muhammad attracted the attention of a wealthy merchant woman named Khadija. Khadija was also a Hanif. Again, this is according to some scholars, and is really heavily debated. Despite being significantly older than Muhammad, being about 40 years old when she met the 25-year-old young man, she soon took a liking to him. She hired him to run a merchant expedition to Syria, a job at which he proved exceptionally competent. One account of this expedition to Syria goes that, due to her personal liking of Muhammad, Khadija paid him twice the normal rate to lead the expedition. To repay her kindness, Muhammad brought back twice the expected profits. Their fruitful business relationship rapidly evolved into a romantic one. Khadija married Muhammad, and they even had multiple daughters, despite Khadija's relatively advanced age. Now that he was married to a wealthy wife who could meet many of their family's material needs, Muhammad had a lot more time on his hands, which he used primarily to meditate and think about theology. Anyways, this is the History of Africa podcast, not the History of Islam podcast. So, to summarize rather quickly, in 610, Muhammad is meditating in a cave near Mecca when the Archangel Gabriel appears to him and delivers a bunch of revelations. He goes back down to his house and tells Khadija what he saw. She believes him about these revelations, but thinks that it couldn't be a bad idea to go and have him talk to her cousin, a Christian priest, about this revelation. He agrees with Khadija that Muhammad is a prophet, so Muhammad decides to start preaching, and, well, you know the story. And if you don't, I'm sure there's a podcast out there which covers the story in better detail than I ever could. These early preachings of the prophet Muhammad would become the earliest basis of the modern religion of Islam. However, it's worth noting that, according to Islamic teachings, that these revelations that Muhammad was preaching were not new ideas, but were rather a call to return to the original religion practiced by Abraham and Adam. As Muhammad's preachings began to catch on in Mecca, the Prophet was already beginning to make some enemies among the city's Quraysh elites. 
The most controversial of the prophet's teaching was the advocation for the removal of polytheistic idols. This teaching did not land well with the Quraysh ruling class. If you'll remember back to our episode on Abraha's march on Mecca, the city made a bunch of its money from pilgrimages to the Kaaba. This famous cubic structure had an extensive history that reaches back into ancient times, but by the lifetime of the prophet, the Kaaba was filled with the statues and symbols of the numerous gods of the religions of the Middle East, with Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, and polytheists alike flocking to Mecca for this all-inclusive pilgrimage. Now, should Muhammad's anti-polytheistic ideas catch on, the Quraysh elites would be forced to remove the polytheistic idols from the Kaaba, and thus give up that lucrative base of pilgrims. So, as Muhammad's preachings grew increasingly popular, the Quraysh grew increasingly desperate in their efforts to slow this growing religion. However, the Quraysh couldn't just go after the Prophet himself. Not only was he himself a member of the Quraysh tribe, he was also protected by his respected uncle, Abu Talib. Instead, they decided to go after his followers, especially those who lacked the protection of a clan. What started as harassment soon escalated into violence, with the worst case happening when an elderly couple of the Prophet's followers were captured by the Quraysh. When they refused to recant their beliefs, they were forced to stand in the hot desert in plate armor until they were roasted alive by the Arabian sun. For Muhammad, this was the breaking point, and he knew that he couldn't allow his most vulnerable followers to stay in the city where they would be persecuted. They would have to take refuge somewhere else. Now, this is where I should probably clarify the relationship between Muhammad's followers, the early Muslims, and Christianity. Today, we think of Christianity and Islam as completely separate and distinct, albeit related, religions. Someone can be either a Christian or be a Muslim. You can't be both. And this is true today, with Christianity and Islam having adopted two considerably different religious dogmas in the centuries since the life of Muhammad. However, during the time of the Prophet himself, this separation certainly existed, but was a lot blurrier. In fact, I think our understanding of this era makes a lot more sense if, instead of using the term Muslim with a capital M, we instead use the meaning of the term in Arabic, one who submits to God. This definition, in its most literal interpretation, could and often did include Christians, Jews, and other monotheists, as well as Muhammad's followers. To give an example of this, and I'm skipping ahead in time a little bit here, so please don't get confused, the Prophet Muhammad would later define the basis of the Islamic community in Medina through one of the world's earliest constitutions. Of course, when defining the Islamic community, the Muslims were included, but so were Christians and Jews who allied themselves to the Muslims. The 25th article of the Charter of Medina states, Quote, the Jews shall be considered as one community, Umat, along with the believers, for the Jews, their religion, and for the Muslim theirs, be one client or patron. While this section only specifically mentions Jews, as there weren't a lot of Christians in Medina at the time, it also accurately reflects the early Muslim view on Christians. From the perspective of early Islam, while Christians and Jews believed in a flawed version of the religion of Adam and Abraham, they still fit under the general umbrella of the community of believers, as long as they allied themselves with the early Muslims. Of course, this definition would change significantly over more than a millennium of Christian and Muslim history of interaction, but this explanation of the relationship between the early Muslims, Christians, and Jews of the Arabian Peninsula should make what happens next make a little bit more sense. With persecution from the Quraysh becoming more extreme, Muhammad advised his followers that they should leave Mecca and flee into a Christian territory. There, they could find tolerance from the fellow followers of Abraham. At first, the most obvious answer was for them to flee north, into the territories of the Ghassanid tribe, a group of Christian Arabs. Maybe, even, they could flee even further north, into the Christian Roman Empire. However, the geopolitical circumstances of the time would not allow such a migration. You see, while Muhammad was beginning his preachings, the Romans and their Ghassanid allies were engaged in a bloody war against the Zoroastrian Persians, which was not going well for the Christian alliance. The Persians had captured the entire Levant, including the holy city of Jerusalem, and Egypt was surely to fall soon after. So, the prospect of Muhammad's followers fleeing into such a war zone where they would be captured by the Zoroastrian Persians would not exactly be a good idea. So, fleeing north was out of the question. However, there was one Christian kingdom nearby where his followers could find safety, Aksum. Remember, through his relationship with his uncle, Muhammad already had a strong relationship with the Aksumite merchant class. In Aksum, he was confident that his followers could find safety from persecution. So, in the year 613, 15 of Muhammad's closest followers, including one of his daughters and her husband, decided to make the voyage to Adulis, and from there, into Aksum. 
The flight from Mecca to the Aksumite Empire would go down in history as the first Hijra, Arabic for migration. Word came to Arma that a group of Arab refugees had docked at the city of Adulis. His advisors reported to him that they were from some group of monotheists fleeing from the persecution of the polytheistic Quraysh. Arma, who the Arabs called al-Najashi, the Arabic word for Negus, decided that he would allow Muhammad's followers to find safe refuge within his kingdom, a decision which was kind of surprising. I mean, Aksum's kingdom is falling apart, its economy is in tatters, the government's barely functional, and he now had a serious rebellion to deal with. Sometime in the 610s AD, around the modern region of Wolkite in western Tigray, civil conflict was brewing. With local economic prospects declining, some of the people of Wolkate decided to take up banditry, robbing caravans and sacking villages for their valuables. Due to the aforementioned economic troubles, these bandits had no problem recruiting new members. Within a few months, this initially small group of bandits quickly swelled into a significant army. Eventually, their numbers grew so strong that they began to expand outside of their initial surroundings and it quickly became apparent that this group of bandits was becoming a real threat to Aksumite security. As these bandits rampaged throughout the western countryside, eventually even the capital city itself came under threat. Arma, seeking to crush these bandits, dispatched an army to march on Wolkate. He appointed a man named Daniel as Hatsani, a gay as term meaning military deputy, and dispatched him to put down the revolt. Under the leadership of Daniel, this army was ruthlessly effective in putting down the bandits. As Daniel's army scattered his enemies, those who survived the battle were banished into the frontier regions of Oxum. But at some point during the war, it seems that Daniel's intentions changed. Even after the bandits had been defeated, Daniel's army continued marauding around the countryside of Wolkate, pillaging thousands of sheep, cows, and goats. Eventually, it became clear to Arma that Daniel had not crushed the bandits, but had merely taken their place. So, he sent another army to put down Daniel's banditry. When these armies fought to a standstill, however, Daniel's ambitions changed further. Understanding that Arma was now actively fighting against him, Daniel decided to proclaim himself the new legitimate king of Oxum. So, desperate for more resources to crush this threat, Arma was forced to turn to another local noble and appoint him as Hatsani. Between this noble's personal bodyguards and more peasant conscripts joining the fray, the force loyal to Arma began pushing into Daniel's domains, but at a great cost and slow pace. So, with all this stuff going on, why is Arma distracting himself with some random refugees from Arabia? Doesn't seem to make sense, right? Then, to make things even less clear, another delegation shows up from Mecca. This time, it's not refugees, but an official diplomatic mission from the Quraysh. The Quraysh diplomats were adamant in their request that Arma deport the Muslims back to Mecca immediately, where they would be punished not only for their beliefs, but also for trying to flee the city. Arma, though, was persistent in his stance that he would continue to house these refugees. The head of the Quraysh delegation, Amir ibn al-As, tried many tactics to convince Arma otherwise. He offered bribes, which Arma turned down. When bribery didn't work, Alas spread rumors that the refugees had blasphemed against Christ in an effort to turn Arma against them. However, when Arma heard these rumors, he simply summoned some of the refugees to his chamber. There they explained that, while they didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God, they did believe that he was one of God's chosen prophets, that he was the Messiah conceived of a virgin birth, and that they believed his teaching should be observed. While Arma didn't necessarily agree with the refugees' religious views, it was enough to prove to him that these refugees had no reason to blaspheme against Christ. After all, even many Christians in Arabia had developed similar views on Christ a long time ago. Many Arab Christians were Ebionites, a group which believed that Christ was not a deity, but was rather a prophet who was so important that he became the adopted son of God. And while Ebionite and early Muslim views differ in some ways, this line of argumentation was already familiar to Arma, not something that would shock or offend him. So, he told Alas and his delegation to kindly leave, and that the Muslim refugees would stay in his care for the foreseeable future. And, as word returned to Mecca that the king of Aksum was protecting the believers, more than a hundred more Muslims fled from Mecca to Adulis. So, why is he doing this? Why, when his empire is crumbling, is Arma so adamant in protecting these refugees? Your economy is struggling, so why not take the bribes, and potentially even improve your relationship with the Quraysh? For one, we must think about the geopolitical situation between Aksum and Arabia before and during Arma's reign. While the empire's Arabian territories had been lost for a few decades now, 
Aksum was still a present power in the tripartite competition for influence in Arabia. For multiple centuries now, Aksum, Rome, and Persia had each struggled to assert their influence on the peninsula. Rome had maintained an alliance with the northern tribes, such as the Ghassanids. Persia had conquered the Gulf region and maintained alliances with numerous smaller Arab states, and Aksum did all of its numerous campaigns and wars that we've covered so many times on this podcast already. However, when the Persians successfully and permanently kicked Aksum out of southern Arabia, it became clear that Aksumite influence in Arabia was on a sharp decline. Thus, the arrival of these refugees provided Aksum with significant diplomatic leverage to increase their influence in Mecca. If these Muslims ever managed to take power in Mecca, they could potentially serve as an important Aksumite ally on the other side of the Red Sea. Also, if war ever broke out between Mecca and Aksum, the leaders of these Muslim refugees could maybe be instituted as a new Aksumite client government. This wasn't some genius scheme on Arma's part either, but was just a continuation of previous Aksumite policies in the past. If you remember back to our episodes on Caleb, before the war with Himyar, Caleb and his father had welcomed Himyarite Christian exiles into the empire as refugees. Their plans were to either use them as diplomatic bargaining chips, or, as actually happened, appoint them as a puppet government after the war with Himyar. So by protecting these Muslim refugees, Arma was ensuring that he would have an ally in these Muslims if they ever took power in Mecca. The second possible reason, which doesn't really contradict the first, is that Arma was a human being. While it's tempting to look at history as driven by amorphous blobs of political and religious institutions, it's important that we humanize Arma. Given how strong his commitment was to protecting the refugees during his reign, I think it's undeniable that he definitely had at least some personal sympathies for the refugees in their plight. Sure, there were certainly geopolitical benefits to taking them in, but some aspects of how he treated him makes me think that there must have been a little bit more going on. Arma regularly interacted directly with the refugees, even sometimes performing religious ceremonies, like confirming conversions and overseeing weddings. Now, some have taken this as proof that Arma was actually converted to Islam himself, but I find this to be doubtful personally. For starters, throughout his reign, Arma continued to use overtly Christian iconography in his coins. It's also worth noting that, in addition to overseeing conversions to Islam, Arma also oversaw the conversion of some of the Muslim delegation to Christianity. Ubaidullah ibn Jash, one of the Muslim refugees, decided that he wanted to convert to Christianity during their time in Aksum. Arma oversaw the conversion of not just Jash, but also his daughter. Some have alleged that Arma was actually a Muslim in secret, and that he only professed Christianity publicly to avoid stigma. While this is possible, there's no contemporary evidence to support such a secret conversion. Since we can't read historical figures' minds, we'll have to regard the prospect of Arma converting as nothing more than a rumor. In my interpretations of the numerous biographies that mention Arma, he was a close friend and ally of the Muslims, but was never a capital M Muslim himself. Rather, he was a Christian, but a member of the lowercase m Muslim community regardless. Anyways, apart from those who converted to Christianity, the remaining refugees left Aksum in 622. The Prophet Muhammad, in what would eventually become known as the Second Hijra, left Mecca and found allies in the city of Yathrib, later known as Medina, and you know the story from there. Under the command of Muhammad, the Muslims of Medina eventually defeated the Quraysh, conquered Mecca, and then went on to rapidly unite most of the Arabian Peninsula by the year 628. And, as we suspected, Arma's decision to welcome the Muslim refugees paid off politically. The Prophet Muhammad remained a close ally to Aksum throughout his life. In 629, in alignment with Arma's political goals, Muhammad drove the Persians, Aksum's biggest rival, permanently out of Arabia. When Arma died in 631, one Arab biography reports that the Prophet Muhammad was immensely saddened by his death. The Prophet knelt down and prayed an absentee prayer, an honor reserved only for members of the community of believers. The Prophet Muhammad would, himself, pass on the next year. Arma, unfortunately, proved unable to reverse his empire's decline. However, the decision he made to allow the Muslim refugees to stay in Aksum would have a profound effect on both the history of Aksum itself and the history of the world. Had Arma handed over the refugees, including Muhammad's daughter and son-in-law, to the Quraysh, it's distinctly possible that history would have gone very differently. By holding these important figures as hostage, it's possible that the Meccans could have used them as bargaining chips in their conflict with Muhammad, meaning that the rise of Islam, and the massive historical legacy which it left on the world, may have ended before it had a chance to even begin. Many other important figures in Islamic history were among the Muslims protected by Arma. 
Said ibn Abi Waqqas, one of the refugees in Aksum, would later become something of a war hero in the wars against the Quraysh. Uthman, a future caliph, was also one of the refugees, as well as several important commanders in the early conquests of the Prophet and later caliphs. Additionally, this decision would, for generations, ensure that Aksum maintained a positive relationship with the rising tide of Islam. This positive relationship would immeasurably slow Aksum's decline. After the death of Muhammad, his successors proved to have more expansionist interests than the late Prophet. The first successor, or caliph, Abu Bakr was more concerned with consolidating the new caliphate's holdings in Arabia against numerous rebellions. However, ten years later, his own successor, the second caliph Umar, would prove far more aggressive in his foreign policy. Under the reign of Umar, the caliphate expanded rapidly. Within the reign of Umar, the entire Sassanid Persian Empire, not so long ago the most powerful empire on earth and Aksum's biggest rival, fell entirely to the caliphate's advance. So too would fall much of the Roman Empire. Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and North Africa, more than two-thirds of the Roman territories at the time, fell to Umar's armies. Ironically, who could be commanding this army other than Amir ibn al-As, the Quraysh diplomat who demanded that Arma hand over the Muslim refugees, and who had switched to Muhammad's banner after the Quraysh's defeat? While the seemingly invincible armies of Umar overran the Romans and Persians, however, there was one empire which remained conspicuously untouched. Watching these developments as shocked spectators were the kings of Aksum. While Umar had shifted the caliphate into a more expansionist foreign policy, he had not changed the empire's policy of friendship towards the Aksumites. This friendship, which Arma had cultivated through his protection of Muslim refugees, had bought the Aksumite empire a great deal of time. Remember, Aksum during the reign of Arma, as well as his successors, was in no position to fight off invaders. Heck, they were struggling to keep their own kingdom afloat at all. Throughout Arma's reign, Daniel's rebellion would gradually wither away. But that didn't exactly return Wolkate to stability. The region would continue to be a center of unrest for the remainder of Aksumite history, and remain only tentatively under Aksumite occupation. Had the Caliph Umar wanted to conquer the unstable Aksumite realm, I have no doubt that he could have. But due to the extremely prescient diplomacy of Arma, he didn't want to. However, while Arma's reign certainly delayed the eventual fall of Aksum, it's hard to call his reign a success. Yes, he preemptively prevented a Muslim invasion which probably would have meant the end of the empire, but he did little to prevent the internal problems which were the root of Aksum's terminal decline. In fact, they would grow worse over the following centuries. Arma is widely perceived as the last Aksumite king to truly rule over an Aksumite empire. The Aksum that we've come to know, one of the most influential and powerful societies of all time, is now a distant memory. From now on, it was a declining regional power at the best of times, and, well, less than that at the worst. Questantinos, Arma's successor, would become the first Negus to never mint coins, indicating that the fiery economy that once engineered Oxumite power was now firmly and permanently extinguished. Questantinos would inherit many of the crises that Arma had left unaddressed, and would suffer the consequences for it. And, if that wasn't bad enough, he and his successors would have yet another challenge to add to their long list. A new East African power will rise, and will be the first force in the region truly capable of challenging Oxum's status as the regional hegemon. These coming rivals will outcompete Oxum in global trade, outmaneuver them diplomatically, and further cement Oxum's status as a declining power. Join us next episode, when the Somalis emerge as East Africa's new power player. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. The History of Africa podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, like Aaron Lynch, Sandro, and Kevin Johnson. The show's editor and I put in about 20 hours or more of work into each episode, so your support is crucial in helping us keep the lights on. Thank you so much for helping us make the show happen. Hey everyone, thank you for listening as always. One more thing before I go. Now, as I'm sure you could tell by that somewhat foreboding ending at the end of this episode, the end of Oxumite civilization is rapidly approaching us. I decided that once Oxum officially falls sometime around the 10th century, oh spoilers, well, is it really a spoiler if it's something that really happened? Uh, whatever. Well, that's going to be the end of our season in ancient Ethiopia. Uh, but a new season will be coming out after that, and the choice of which civilization we'll be focusing on will be left to you. Yes, you, the person listening to this right now. 
I've already determined that it's going to be somewhere vaguely in West Africa, but I'm going to leave the choice of which civilization in particular we focus on to you. You guys, the listeners, will get to vote on whatever our new season will focus on. That could be the militaristic Ashanti Empire of the early modern period, the wealthy Ghana Empire of antiquity, the powerful medieval kingdom of Canaan, which lasted for more than a millennium, the artistically unrivaled kingdom of Benin, or the Sokoto Caliphate, an empire that was, for a little bit, the single most literate country in the world at the end of the 19th century. Or, if you have something else in mind, you can suggest your own ideas instead. Whichever choice gets the most votes wins. All you have to do is go on our Patreon and pledge literally any amount. It can be like 10 cents, it really doesn't matter how much. Any amount pledged will let you vote. Ah, I love democracy.